I had a brownie. <laughs> I had a guy on Camelback and Central ask me the same. I <laughs> 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 I had a brownie. Oh. Different context, probably. I don't know. Logan is so good for like one to two laughs per pod and like one dud. <laughs> one dud. I've always got my one dud in there. And that's okay. I mean, keep swinging. One time I said like, you know, eight episodes ago, I said something about Gorbachev tear down that wall. And you guys had no idea what I was talking about. I know what you're talking about. No, you did in the Nick moment. Well, I'm in the a moment. Cold War Pull survivor. Up <laughs> Pull up that tape. I <laughs> literally moment, did nuclear like, drills <laughs> hiding under my desk in Nick, fourth grade. Nick ministered with our kilt wearing front row praying Ed, who's a Cold War veteran. <laughs> it's true. I'm a Cold War survivor. That was that was some rough times, you guys. You yeah. wouldn't know. Well, here we are. I, I don't remember that reference. I would have I would have at least hat tipped you if it if it if it if it came in passing that's my other wall reference because like we keep seeing walls and it's like well you know donald trump but there's one more wall that i think of oh don't forget the wall of wall. jericho i don't know <laughs> oh gosh that's the lord is not done with you <laughs> president trump. i really need to see that video have you Up, seen the one update he was he like will the... reinstate <laughs> you <laughs> Sorry. Totally it cuts to the narrator, and the narrator in super calm tone was like, "He was though." Yeah, she ended up doing jail time. Isn't that Paula? What's her name? Oh my gosh! Anyways, speaking of that, <laughs> oh um, my the, gosh, the uh, Rapture Index is down a point. Oh, so that's oh. good. Yeah, that's great. Mm, it, people have hope. It hit an all-time high <laughs> at our last filming. It was an all-time high of 188, and it's knocked down a notch. Guys, there's a blood moon over Russia. <laughs> Gog and Magog are out to play. <laughs> Gog and Magog. Gog and Magog. Uh, Israel, uh, Israel can do no wrong uh, in the eyes of the Lord. Oh, yeah, I'll, I'll tell you what. The eclipse definitely oh. had the rapture index on its toes, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. It was not. People were remember, wigging out. Remember when there could just be an eclipse and people were like, oh, that was cool. And it wasn't like a lot of people being like, this, this is the is end it. of the world. This there are people it. in the World Economic Forum trying to murder you and your family. <laughs> like, it, yeah. it just... There was right. definitely a period of time there because ancient humans they would freak out at every eclipse and start sacrificing their first Totally. <laughs> Mel then, Gibson's Apocalypto. Yeah. <laughs> Incredibly exactly. underrated just, film. Well, it's so good. And, and like that happened. And then yes. we learned science and we were better for it. And then now we've gone over that event horizon yep. and we're worst for it yep. because we're so smart that we're dumb and we You're freak so out right. again. For most of human history, eclipses were like wild. Then everyone was like, oh, there is a moon that is passing in front of uh, the sun. It's all science and math and we can predict <laughs> yeah. these things now. We don't have to kill anybody. I took a girl that I had a crush on in college on a date to Mel Gibson's Apocalypto. Terrible um, date like movie. A Holy crap. Romantic movie. Well, this uh, is what she was saying to me during and after it was like she was making fun of me she's like this is not a good date movie and i just see about myself she was onto something this yeah. is <laughs> a valid, a valid, that's a valid in point. my mind i was like this will be good so like do you get what i mean yes. yeah. yeah of course yeah. like right. oh but um mel gibson directed a american indian or a native of uh, uh to rip out the heart of an animal and then take a bite out of it i'm like yeah yeah that's cool that's, great. <laughs> that's cool that's yeah. wild content have you seen that movie Nope, I don't even oh know what Oh my is. goodness. That's a disturbing movie. That's one of those movies that just lives with you. Yeah, and it's one of the movies that like people don't talk about very often, so then you'll like randomly see someone and and they'll have never heard of it and you'll tell them to watch it and they'll watch it and they'll text you and be like that was mind-blowingly good. Yeah, why did you do that to me? It's yeah. one of those things <laughs> where watch it. after you watch it you go gosh, I'm so disturbed. You don't have the out of going, but it's just a movie. Cuz that happened. Like that is a, that, that 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 and worse totally. probably literally happened to people. Totally. Yeah. And did. Plus, Mel Gibson's working on the sequel to The Passion yeah, yeah. of the Christ now, which is going to be lit. There's the resurrection. The second part. <laughs> well, yeah, because he, the resurrection's not the end, though. Uh, oh. The compassion of the Christ. Yeah, the chosen. <laughs> um, should we read a YouTube comment, our favorite YouTube comment? Yeah, we've been getting some like aggressive ones. Do they bother you, Nick? Do they no, hurt your heart? They're, no, they're hilarious. Actually, we ended the last That's episode. Should we do like a giveaway for them? Telling people, hey, we, we take to heart, especially all the angry people on the internet. We love those comments. Yep. We think about them a lot. Um, they <laughs> oh, affect, I see. I see the one you're Nick about to read. They, <laughs> I just pulled stories. them up. They affect our identity. Well, I'm talking about the one that I mentioned before. It actually wasn't part of this podcast. Okay. <laughs> yeah. But our our channel got one from a just a clip of a praise a short praise video, and 
this user says <laughs> to a, a video of, a, of of one of our one of the worship leaders at this church singing a song. He says, "This is defo some effed up BS." <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's like what about this? <laughs> this is effed up. I mean, okay, I get it. You're an atheist, so you can say it's BS that God is worthy of it all. But what's so effed up about it? I mean, I like defo, defo, yeah. defo, like defo. There's no debate. It's just definitely effed up BS. It's like a good-hearted person calmly singing a song to the God that they believe in, as yeah. have many of the people in history. Yeah. Yo, yeah. defo. It's yeah. Defo. I just, there's a, some effed just, up BS. Here's a, here's another along. good one. Um, justice is the paganistic human sacrifice of your own son because your quote unquote God is incapable of forgiveness. Then someone responded to them, "Who hurt you?" <laughs> Wait, was, was that it me? Someone you? No. Okay. <laughs> no, someone named Katherine Johnson. Dude, if you're Dude, watching Katherine, Katherine Johnson, I think that might keep be one Duncan of my Keep Duncan on the we atheist. That might be one of my troll it. accounts. I think I may have said that. That's one of my favorite Who comebacks. hurt you? <laughs> Who hurt you is such a great thing because it it's the 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 vitriol of uh not all atheists, a lot of atheists are super chill, really kind people, but some of them are so aggressive <laughs> against it. I'm like, "Bro, like I'm just a person with a belief." Right. I'm glad you're you. <laughs> Believe whatever you yeah. want. Like can't, yeah. He, yeah, am I allowed in your world of, of hyper tolerance? Am I allowed to have my belief? Oh, and, and you know just, what the best thing was? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> number one, number two. I was making a piece of content one time, and I went on um, the atheist Reddit thread, um, and I said, um, "Hey, I'm a Christian pastor. I'm working on something." Um, <laughs> oh gosh, <laughs> just, sweet. Let's go. Describe Christians in one word in the comments. It was the same time I was doing that billboard, billboard thing I was talking about because I was just yeah. trying to learn. And um, people were being really, really aggressive and stuff. And it doesn't bother me because I actually agree with a lot of the things yeah, they're yeah. saying. Yeah. But then the the mod deleted the post. And your, op your post? My post. And then all of these atheists were like flooding my... Because um, they thought you reneged they it? Were like, they were like flooding my um, whatever uh, messages. And they were like, oh, can't take the heat, huh? I'm like, no, actually, actually your guy can't take the heat. Mm. <laughs> like, I don't yeah. care. Yeah. <laughs> that would have I would have lost sleep over that you could really no one in an atheist reddit thread could ever say anything that the lord god himself has not said in the woes against the pharisees yeah. or in ezekiel <laughs> chapter 22 I was gonna say, just watch the I mean beat that yeah like this is why when people say content. to me people say to me sometimes after sermons they'll say I think you're too mean to christians and I'll say okay that's fine. You can have your opinion. But do you think that I've said anything that God hasn't said in scripture? And I'm not equating myself with God. I'm just saying that those are my observations. Mm -hmm. And if so, do you still think that's a problem? Mm. Yeah. He's asking you. Logan. And they always not just turn and walk I thought it was rhetorical. Turn no. and walk away. You're one of those people. I would say I'd. I would say you're right and you I'm wrong. You represent them. <laughs> no, don't walk away. I would say you're right and I'm wrong. And then just walk I'm going to be so good that's at marriage. That's what I was going to say. You're, you're set that's up. What I, that's what I love Ladies, about the Lady, Logan's ready. Wow, there Logan's you go, guys. Logan's ready for marriage. Yeah. Based should on that we, one comment alone. Yeah. Should, should we down. at our church make a reality program <laughs> with Logan? <laughs> And it's the Christian Bachelor. Yes. And it's not like, I like the Bachelor, but it's not like sketchy, you know, like the Bachelor or like tangentially, latently Christian like the Bachelor. It's just like a real thing. Yeah. And we get Logan and we get a couple ladies in the mix, nice ladies who are looking for a husbo. And <laughs> we get Logan in the Defo mix. Defo looking for a husbo. For a <laughs> <That's> <laughs> so up, yeah. yeah. I think that'd be good content. That would be, that would I'm definitely be a, that would be a slow it. burn. That'd Patreon. be the most chill. The uh, if you got the actual bachelor mm -hmm. bachelor bachelorette on ABC's producers, they would absolutely ruin that show because they'd just be trying to tell you to be, to like do and say things that you, that aren't you. Yeah, totally. And then you, some girl would tell you to shave your mustache, and you would do it because you were falling in love with her. And then another girl would be crying because mm. she loved your mustache. And I'll tell you what. That's good TV. That's good content. <laughs> That's good TV. Let's Whoa. go. <laughs> yep. All right. Cool. Let's jump in. Let's jump in. So we are in the last moments before exile. Um, warning, there's very aggressive language in this chapter. There's not as much of it as there is in chapter 16, but there, of what there is, it's actually more aggressive. Um, and um, so these are the last moments before exile. What does that mean? It means that exile is the most significant um, cultural moment for the people of Israel after coming into the land. And people don't understand the exile because the exile is the thing that does not happen narratively. It happens prophetically. 
So there's no like big narrative where they're like, da, 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 da. it kind of happens narratively in Kings, but not as much so as like the entrance into the land. And so this is kind of like a hole for people maybe, and they don't see it quite clearly, but they came into the land in Joshua and now they are kicked out of the land. And a lot of the prophets are about this thing. And so this is happening here right now. And this is the last moments before exile. Keep in mind that Ezekiel has already been in exile because they took a small amount of people um, first. Here's a revelation connection for you as we start. Um, David Campbell, G.K. Beale, the Old Testament background of the image of the kings of earth committing acts of immorality with the harlot also has them turning against her and destroying her, Ezekiel 16 and 23, where Jerusalem represents the harlot. So what he's saying is, is he's saying, something that I think that all of us understand, but maybe not everybody who's watching would understand, which is that um, oftentimes God chooses to use sexual language to talk about um, covenant um, um, disobedience, and that's the way that he chooses to do it. I think because sex is so intimate and covenants are so intimate between God, I think he, I believe that's why he did that, but he's not talking about sexuality in this chapter. He's talking about the covenant, and he's using sexuality. The best example is Hosea. Mm. Mm -hmm. Hosea is actually doing things so it's not just talk he's actually committing you know sexual acts with this prostitute and um, God is using it to show something covenantal right okay very cool so let's jump in to this together the literary genre of chapter 23 is an allegorical judgment diatribe the word of the Lord came to me. Yeah, isn't that cool? The word of the Lord came to me. Um, son of man, there were two women, the daughters of one mother. They played the whore in Egypt. They played the whore in their youth. Their breasts were pressed and their virgin bosoms handled. And the crazy thing is in Hebrew, that, that verse is actually more graphic. Um, so they, att they attempted to make it less graphic. And I'm not going to say what it says in Hebrew because it makes me uncomfortable. I'm glad you didn't ask me to read because mine is much more graphic. Is it? Mm -hmm. um, verse four. These are like the kind of texts I read when I was like nine and I was holding my King James Bible. It is. I was like nine holding my King James Bible in chapel as a kid. And I was like. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. I, wow. That's hilarious. Ahola was the name of the elder. Aholaba was the name of her sister. They became mine that's god's they bore sons and daughters ahola is samaria and aholaba is jerusalem does us a real solid here yeah and just tells us this is what this is remember that the people of samaria are descended from a similar group of people as um the people of israel so they're very close obviously we have you know all of the things about that in the text ahola who is Samaria, takes up six verses. And Aholaba, who is um, Jerusalem, takes up 35. So he's going to talk about Samaria, the girl that is Samaria for six verses, and then the girl that's Jerusalem for 35. Ahola played the whore while she was mine. That's Samaria. She lusted after her lovers, the Assyrians, warriors. This exact idea is in Hosea chapter 8. Clothed in purple... Governors and commanders, all of them desirable young men, horsemen riding on horses. She bestowed their whoring upon them, the choicest men of Assyria, all of them. She defiled herself with all of the idols of everyone after whom she lusted. So this is political and spiritual adultery. This is actually shown in archaeology. Um, John Taylor points out, um, the, he says, quote, the historicity of the charge is borne out with a good deal of evidence. The black obelisk of Shalmaneser III, which is what we're looking at, illustrates Jehu prostrating himself before the Assyrian king um, and offering gifts. Um, so he's, they're basically showing th this type of political connection that should not have existed according to God did exist, and there's you know a record of it. Um, Verse 8, she didn't give up her whoring that she had begun in Egypt. In her youth, men had lain with her lain with her, and handled her virgin bosom and poured out their whoring lust upon her. 
Therefore, I delivered her into the hands of her lovers, into the hands of the Assyrians, after whom she loved it, lo uh, lusted those uncovered her nakedness. We don't need to cover that again, but if you don't understand that turn of phrase in chapter 10, we explain that um, in the video on chapter 22 and the connection there between um, Noah and his son. They seized her sons and daughters, and as for her, they killed her with the sword. So that's Samaria. This happened in 2 Kings chapter 18 in 722 BC, and they were destroyed by King Shalmaneser V. So if you'd like to read kind of the text behind the text, you can read 2 Kings chapter 18. She became a byword among women when judgment had been executed upon her. A byword is a famous name known for something. It's a name that means something else. Like when kids, when I was a kid, would shoot a basketball and they would yell, Kobe! That's what it oh. means. Kobe at that moment is a yeah. byword. They're not Kobe. They're not saying they're Kobe. They're they're invoking a byword because of what they're doing. And mm, so they're like, it's like a temporary nickname. Oh. Yeah, and they're saying um, they're saying people will yell out Samaria because of some sort of situation like this thing, which is pretty wild. Verse eleven. Her sister Aholaba, that's Israel, saw this, and she became even more corrupt than her sister in her lust and in her whoring, which was worse than that of her sister. You see this a lot in the prophets. You see God bringing in the other countries and he's like, they don't even have me as their God and you behave worse than them. Mm -hmm. That's like a very common turn in mm -hmm. the prophetic books. She lusted after the Assyrians, governors, commanders, warriors clothed in full armor, horsemen riding on horses, all of them desirable young men. And I saw that she was defiled. They both took the same way, but she carried her whoring further. She saw men portrayed on the wall, the images of the Chaldeans portrayed in vermilion, wearing belts on their waists, with flowing turbans on their heads, all of them having the appearance of officers, a likeness of Babylonians whose native land was Chaldea. When she saw them, she lusted after them and sent messengers to them in Chaldea. So the idea is sexuality in this is spirituality. So the idea is the, uh, Jerusalem did not have um, overtly sexual feelings. The people in Jerusalem did not have those feelings um, or urges for the people in um, these invading countries of the Chaldeans. Whether they did or didn't, it's not what it's talking about. It's talking about yeah. they saw their gods. They saw the way they worshipped. They saw them on the hills in these pagan sex cults and they were like we want to do that yeah that's the idea um and this uh verse 16 this happens in second kings 16 when ahaz made a sinful alliance with tiglath pileser the third so if you like taking down cross references second kings two kings one six um verse 17 and the Babylonians came to her into the bed of love. They defiled her with their whoring lust, and she was defiled by them after uh, she turned from them in disgust. And I think without you know going into anything too graphic, I think a lot of people have um, an experience uh, physically of eating too much and feeling disgusted by you know overdoing it or drinking too much, or for some of us using drugs and we feel disgusted, or for some of us having a sexual experience that we thought we wanted, but then afterwards we are disgusted ourselves by the choice that we've made. And I think that that is built into us. That's the nature of sin and the way that God has made us and how it is a sin against the, the nature of God that's in us. Verse 19, um, verse 18. When she carried on her whoring so openly and flaunted her nakedness, um, I turned in disgust from her as I had turned in disgust from her sister. So God is using a picture that we understand, which is a picture of graphic sexuality and how that would make a husband, God is the husband of Israel in this story, how that would make a husband feel, it's pretty obvious. He's saying, when you serve other gods, that's how it makes me feel. Wow. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. He's like, it's exactly the same. Um, yet she increased her whoring. So God turning away did not change the behavior of Israel. Remembering the days of her youth when she played the uh, whore in the land of Egypt and lusted after her lovers there, 
whose members were like those of donkeys and whose issue was like that of horses. Verse 21, thus you longed after, uh, thus you longed for the lewdness of your youth when the Egyptians handled your bosom and pressed um, your young breasts. So the idea there, according to Ian Duguid, is um, he says, she remembered the days of her youth in Egypt, not as the time when the Lord delivered her from bondage as the book of Deuteronomy repeatedly urges Israel to remember, but as the time when they enjoyed pleasure is no longer theirs. Mm. Do you get what he's saying? It's like a, that's a really good reading of the yeah. text. Yeah, that is. He's saying God freed you from slavery and you were like, oh yeah, but then we could worship whoever we want. Yep. And you're like, mm. oh my gosh, this is really. Simon Devries said, quote, she had forgotten what she should have remembered and remembered what she should have forgotten. Hmm. And, you know, that's like the, the most graphic language is now behind us. And I'm glad we don't do Q and A's at this. When I did this Bible study live at our church here, I was like terrified that someone would ask me a question about those verses I just read. Cause I like, don't, I just made, it just makes me uncomfortable. I like desperately sure. don't want to. Do it. I was literally just thinking, what in the heck was this like teaching this to a room full of people instead of a small room of three well-mannered adults? Yeah, that that would have been terrifying. I can think of a lot of things I would have rather done. Than <laughs> totally gone. Good. Happy Thursday evening to everybody. Open up to Ezekiel chapter 23. Let's just dive right into. We're just going to start with verse 19. <laughs> yeah. Members so, the size of donkeys. So, um, which is a thumbnail title, by the way. No, it is not. <laughs> so, defo some. I, you know, defo. I make um, defo. That guy might like this content. Um, <laughs> this is not f up BS. <laughs> so he's like, he's like, ah, these guys got a point. Um, yeah. Actually, I'm going to delete that other one. <laughs> you know, I make no apologies for the Bible. I really don't. I think this content is great. It just, I think it is having its desired effect. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. That's what we're supposed to feel is like exactly. uncomfort and exactly. Well, yeah. Imagine being. Oholaba in this story. Yeah. Yeah. Hearing this and going, oh, that's me. That's my people. Totally. And all the misogynists are just like, it isn't about us. It's about the women. You're like, nope, nope. It's about everybody. Yeah. It's about Israel. Um, verse 22. Therefore, Oholaba, thus says the Lord, behold, I will stir against you, your lovers from whom you turned in disgust. I will bring them against you from every side, the Babylonians and the Chaldeans. Um, Picod. Um, that is referenced in Jeremiah 50 in relation to Babylon. It's an Aramean tribe, if you'd like to take notes. The Chaldeans were a, a governing class of Babylon, the magnates. They were the wealthy and influential people of Babylon. I may have gotten this from a commentary. I can't remember. And then Shoah and Koah, which are referenced in Isaiah 22. We really don't know much about them. It's probably just another grouping of Assyrians. And all the Assyrians, with them desirable young men, governors, commanders, Officers and men of renown, all of them riding on horses. They shall come against you from the north with chariots and wagons and a host of peoples. They shall set uh, themselves against you on every side with buckler, shield, helmet. I will commit the judgment to them, and they shall judge you according to their judgments. So you get what he's saying here. He's saying not only are you guys going to be sent into exile, not only is your land going to be taken over, your land is going to be taken over specifically by the people that you worshipped their gods. Those specific people are going to come in and boot you out of the country. And I'll direct my jealousy, verse 25, against you that they may deal with you in fury. They shall cut off your nose and your ears and your survivors shall fall by the sword. They'll seize your sons and your daughters and your survivors shall be devoured by fire. They will strip you of your clothes and take away your beautiful jewels. I'll put an end to your lewdness and your whoring that was begun in the land of Egypt. So you shall not lift up your eyes to them or remember Egypt anymore. Um, Logan, could you read 28 through 31? For thus says the Lord God, behold, I will deliver you into the hands of those whom you hate, into the hands of those from who you turned in disgust. And they shall deal with you in hatred and take away all the fruit of your labor Leave you naked and bare, and the nakedness of your whoring shall be uncovered. Your lewdness and your whoring have brought this upon you, because you've played the whore with the nations and defiled yourself with their idols. You've gone the way of your sister. Therefore, I will give her cup into your hand. Uh, Daniel Block notes that to heighten the rhetorical force of this pronouncement, Ezekiel introduces a new but common image, the cup 
of woe. So you saw that in verse 31. He says, I'm going to give her cup into your hand. This is the idea. Literally, it's a drinking vessel. Um, this is still block used by kings and poor folk. In the Old Testament, the term usually carries a figurative sense. Uh, representing the experiences that God as a divine host pours out mm. for his guests. Mm. The cup of the faithful was filled with divine blessings, but the vessel of the wicked overflows with his wrath. Um, I like the synchrony how in verse 10 we talked about his her sister became a byword. Yeah. And then... In this verse, he actually uses her, her, her as a byword. Oh, wow. I didn't even notice and, that. And says, you become like your sister. Kobe. Yeah. Kobe. That's good. That's good exegesis. Verse 32. Thus says the Lord, you shall drink your sister's cup. This is this vessel of woe. Um, think about this in relation to Jesus. Lord, let this cup pass. Right? Yet not my will, but yours be done. Um, Jesus was called by God to drink the cup of wrath for all people of all time. And he was like, I don't want to, right? And then, but then he did because he surrendered to God. Can I bring up one more thing? Yeah, of though? course. Um, maybe sometimes it's also represents blessing too, where it's like my cup overflow. You anoint my head with oil, my cup exactly. overflows. Exactly. So it could also be good. It is. That's what Block said. He said it can be a cup of blessing. Or I a see. Cup I of see. Woe. Yeah. Oh, totally. Yeah. My cup overflows. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's thank good. Goodness, it does, but maybe not the cup of woe. Yeah, the cup of woe. You're like, I kind of want like a six ounce espresso cup for this. Yeah, yeah. right. Like for a the shot, cup of a blessing. Shot of woe. <laughs> for the cup of blessing, <laughs> I want one of those like boomer coffee cups that's actually just a, a cereal bowl. <laughs> yeah, you can have the, 64 ounces of Folgers Harkins coffee in this thing. Theater. Give me the Costco yeah. sample size of the woe and the Costco family size <laughs> of the blessing. Totally, a post-it note of woe, <laughs> but a CVS receipt of blessing. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. That's good. Yes, Lord. Shout out to our sponsor, CVS. Yes, Lord, we pray for everyone watching that they would experience a CVS receipt wow. length of blessing unfolding mm. in their life. Those are all coupons, and they're never for coupons of stuff that I buy. Yeah, yeah totally. <laughs> it's like, oh, sweet, four tampon coupons. What am I going to do with that? <laughs> batteries. Um, <laughs> okay, no batteries I would use. <laughs> Only a kid who grew up with charging video. I was going to say, I just really <laughs> out of myself. Batteries. Disdain. <laughs> batteries batteries yeah. in when I was growing up were such a big deal. I know. Yeah. I it was everything. Those. Oh, it was everything. You hoard those? I would hoard. I Still to this day, I have a drawer in mm. my house devoted to batteries. Of course, 100%. you can't play video games without them when right. you're a child. It's a yeah. big deal. I'm sorry. You and no your idea. parents don't go buy you batteries at 9 o'clock at night. They're like, what's wrong with you? You're supposed to be asleep. <laughs> yeah, you that's don't a good know point. what it was like being a Cold War survivor. Yeah. Oh, dude. I'm and sorry. The, the the Sega Genesis handheld had like 86 batteries in it. Like it was so ludicrous how much it took to power that thing. The pain of playing Game Boy, Ugh. which took four bat four AA batteries in the That's back, right. the original Game Boy, and like getting to a level on like Paper Boy, <sighs> and then it dies and you have to start mm -hmm. over because there's no memory. Totally, because we didn't pay attention to the blinking light or the light that would slowly fade mm -hmm. down. You're like, no, 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 it's good, it's good, we're still good. <laughs> Just, I'm, we're still I'm good. almost at a save. Safe point. Any kid that had an AC adapter for their Game Boy was so rich. Yep. I had so much respect I didn't even for know those, those kids. Existed. That just shows you how poor we were. Oh man, they just plug it in. <laughs> we're a Walkman. Did you play video games as a kid? I mean, I loved me a Game Boy. Yeah. Oh yeah. True. They weren't gender exclusive. They were for everybody. I went to probably three hundred travel basketball games that my brother was playing in, and I don't remember any of them, and I didn't watch any of them because I was playing Pokemon Red on my Game Boy the whole time. I regret nothing. Yeah, it was so fun. It was time well spent. My son came home from school a couple weeks ago. He said, "Dad, have you ever heard of Pokemon?" I was like, "Son, I'm going to bless you with an everlasting blessing in this house. The Get the cup of, of blessing." blessing. <laughs> Because I've got the picture. Go to CVS emotionally because we are about to unfold a receipt of blessing upon you, Ezra. And I Here said to him, I said, we have every Pokemon game and every system in this house right now. <laughs> and he started playing through them and it was amazing. That was awesome. I just love, That's by the way, that that image of you playing Pokemon on your video game, uh, your brother's playing basketball. Fast forward and you're both in ministry. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Yeah. I don't know. I just, I just love that. I just love yeah. 
Totally, yeah. That the, tapestry. The Lord chooses that which is foolish to shame the wise. <laughs> <laughs> God's like, we got this square jawed buff guy who has normal <laughs> hobbies. We want him? No, no, no. no, no. Get that, that guy. guy who has Kid A by Radiohead memorized, <laughs> uh, who's played every Pokemon game and he's well into his 30s. Yeah. Um, we'll take both. So, therefore, thus says the Lord God, you'll drink your sister's cup. That's where we left off. It's deep and large. You shall be laughed at and held in derision, for it contains much. So really, uh, our jokes were exactly what the text was was about to say, which is funny, because he's saying people are going to notice how long it's going to take you to drink this mm -hmm. um, cursing, this woe. You'll be filled with drunkenness and sorrow, a cup of horror and desolation, the cup of your sister Samaria. He doesn't even use the name anymore. He doesn't even use the sister's name. Uh -huh. yeah. He just says the name. Yeah. You shall drink it and drain it out and gnaw its shards. Oh, and tear your breasts, which is just kind of like a general, like, like just like a, just very like sad, like, oh my gosh, like, you know. Um, this brought me back to your sermon on Sunday in hmm. the understanding that if you don't kill your sin, your, your sin will kill you. And that they yeah. went astray in worshiping those idols and then those idols overcame, overcame and overtook them. It just wow. reminded me of that I didn't even correlation. think of that. Yeah, that is a really good connection. Once saved, always saved. I can do whatever I want. Mm -hmm. Are they saying gnaw its shards as in like chewing broken glass of the cup? Yeah. Yes. Wow. That's harsh. So you're going to drink the cup. Graphic. You're going to mm -hmm. drink the cup. You're going to drain the cup. You know, every last drop. Then you're going to smash it. Then you're going to eat the cup. Then you're going to hit yourself as you're attempting to digest. It's pretty... Good heavens. It's pretty awful. Most normal Taco Bell experience. Yeah. <laughs> what did he say? <laughs> Most normal Taco Bell experience. Oh, my god! Because it takes all that. Dude, Taco Bell is taking it. more L's on this podcast than the boomer generation. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Like, imagine being a boomer who's employed at Taco Bell. You just hate us. <laughs> yeah, totally. And you also grew up as Scientologist. Oh, my <laughs> goodness. And you have a single daughter that's in love with Logan. That's our audience. <laughs> you just like can't stop taking L's. That's our audience. You're like, this guy's going to be my son-in-law. <laughs> He's the one that says Magog. Yeah. <laughs> Gog and Magog. <laughs> yeah, totally. Um, I have spoken, declares the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord, because you've forgotten me. You've cast me behind your back. You yourself must bear the consequences of your lewdness and whoring. And lest we think that we're different than Israel... Um, as uh, Carly, I think, really wisely pointed out, I do believe that God will um, turn his back on people who continue in sin. Um, I believe that. I believe that's what the, the New Testament says. And I don't always know exactly how to justif uh, ju uh, justify that against my view of, of salvation. I just know that we have to hold those things in equal hand. I do think there's a difference between the blatant, repeated sin mm -hmm. and a sin that you are repeatedly committing that breaks your heart. Totally. There is that we have to make that distinction. You're so right. And if we think that what confession means is just saying to God that it's sin yeah. and not first feeling it in our gut and heart yeah. and then saying it, we don't understand confession. Can I bring up one quick thing? Um, you always can and you don't need to ask. Great. Uh, <laughs> I remember one of the, it was the first time I ever heard you speak. It was at a camp. Do you remember this? You spoke at Camp Love. Um, oh, yeah. But you did a talk. Yeah. It was like 10 things I wish I knew before going into ministry. Oh, yeah. One of the ones that really stuck out to me was you can sacrifice your calling like with unrepentant sin. Or you can like, mm. I forget the language you used. I have it written down though. And um, yeah, that was powerful and like really convicting. That was the first time I heard you speak too. Right. I was like, this is a special kid right here. <laughs> yeah, I think it was like 10. I can't even find the notes. Forget it. My Google Drive is too full. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. That's very kind. We, uh, for uh, Verse 35. Um, verse 36. The Lord said to me, son of man, will you judge Ahola and Aholaba? So now he's talking to Ezekiel. Ezekiel's in exile. Jerusalem's about to go into exile. And he's like, 
Ezekiel, will you judge uh, these nations? Declare to them their abominations. They've committed adultery. Their blood is on their hands. With their idols, they've committed adultery. And they've even offered up to them for food the children whom they had borne to me. So you see again, and this is rare in the Old Testament. Usually they don't tell you what the pagan sex cults were doing. But they do tell you in Ezekiel a bunch that they were offering up children. There's this horrific... Um, there was this horrific discovery of this Baal idol or this Asherah idol, I can't remember, but it actually had like a some sort of like spring-loaded some type of hand where they would put a baby in it and they would push it and the other hand would actually just destroy this child. Mm. And this is, you know, I think understanding things like that really helps people because people are like, man, God is so upset. Mm -hmm. And you're like, yeah, you'd be upset too. It's crazy that they came up with these wild inventions. They were like, you know, they were they were serving demons. Yeah, it's so they insane. were they had somehow demons had gotten in their culture and had said, "Hey, if you kill babies, we will send you rain and all this stuff." And you know, um, moreover, they have uh, this. They've done to me. They've defiled my sanctuary on the same day and profaned my sabbaths. You get what he's saying? He's saying you offered up your kids and then you went I'm to church. It. It's insane. <laughs> It's absolutely insane. When they'd slaughtered their children and sacrificed to their idols on the same day they came to, into my sanctuary to profane it. Oh yeah, I forgot that. He does say it that succinctly. Mm -hmm. And behold, this is what they did to my house, in my house. They even went, sent for men from afar to whom a messenger was sent. And behold, uh, they came. Uh, for them, you bathed yourself, painted your eyes, adorned yourself with ornaments. You sat on a stately couch with a table spread before it on which you had placed my incense and oil. So effectively what he's saying is he's saying you've used the instruments of the temple for cultic purposes. So picture you've taken the Bible mm -hmm. out of the worship center of your church and you're ripping the pages out to light candles at like a demonic seance. This wow. is like this is like the, what he's saying. He's like, not only are you doing it, but you're like it's using my stuff yeah. for it. Mm -hmm. um, and note the, uh, the usage of the possessive pronoun there, my. Mm -hmm. So he's saying my incense and my oil. He uses that uh, possessive pronoun there twice. The sound of a carefree multitude was with her. Um, I wrote down, as if it isn't bad enough, the idea here is that people were there to um, watch what was going on. With them, the common sort, drunkards were brought from the wilderness, and they put bracelets on the hands of the women, beautiful crowns on their heads. This I, then I said of her who is worn out by adultery. This is the same word um, in verse 43 that Joshua uses to describe worn out sacks and worn out sandals. Um, now they will continue to use her for a whore, even her. Um, for they've gone into her and as men go into her as a prostitute. Um, thus they went into Ahola and Aholaba. Samaria and Jerusalem, lewd women, but righteous men shall pass uh, judgment on them with the sentence of adulteresses and with the sentence of women who shed blood because their adulteresses and blood is on their hands. For thus says the Lord God, bring up a vast host against them. Hmm. And um, that word there is, is actually kind of confusing because when it says Lord of hosts in Psalms, it means the Lord of armies, which is, I think, how they should translate it in English because it's less confusing. This is actually a different word um, in Hebrew than that. Make them an object of terror and a plunder, and the host shall stone them and cut them down with their swords. Man, why did I pick this book? Yeah. Oh, I know. Man. I'm hoping the next chapter is more hopeful. The, dude, the end of this book is so hopeful. It's magnificent. Can't wait. It flips so hard. We're in the valley of the shadow of death. <laughs> yeah. Can't wait. Um, <laughs> we're not in the valley of the shadow of death. We're in the we're valley in the of work death. In. Yeah. Yeah. True. We're, we're just dead. Yeah. yeah this, is, this is no shadow here. <laughs> we're a part of the valley. Yes. Um, they shall kill their sons and daughters, burn up their houses. Thus I will put an end to lewdness in the land. That all women may take warning and not commit lewdness as you have done, and they shall return your lewdness upon you, and you shall bear the penalty for your sinful idolatry, and you shall know that I am the Lord. This is a pivotal place, pivotal place in the Old Testament. No more parables mm -hmm. from Ezekiel, no more pictures, just the plain horrifying truth. Hmm. God wasn't lying. He loves Israel with a passion that burns deeper than anything that we have experienced. He will once again let the truth of his promised curses for dis disobedience have their effect. 
worse than Egypt, worse than the wilderness, worse even than his absence. God sent them prophets and they murdered them. God sent them priests and they ignored them. God sent them a land and they defiled it. God sent them a temple and they defiled it. God sent them kings and they were even worse than the people. Their fathers they've abandoned. This is the eternal lie of sin. Mm -hmm. All the way back to the fruit in the garden. It promises sweetness and delivers until it turns sour and you hate it. It's time for the exile. Um, yeah. Even watching the northern kingdom get sent out and the first wave of the southern kingdom has not dissuaded them. It is time. So then the two sisters, um, uh, Ahola and Aholaba, check this out from Acts chapter 8. Would you read that for us, Carly? Yeah. Now when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent them to Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit, for he had not yet fallen on any of them, but they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Now when Simon saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power also, so that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, May your silver perish with you, because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have neither part nor lot in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. Repent, therefore, of this wickedness of yours, and pray to the Lord that, if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. And Simon answered, Pray for me to the Lord, that nothing of what you have said may come upon me. Now, when they had testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel to many villages of the Samaritans. So, outside of the many tale of Simon there in, in the middle of it. What I was mostly focusing on was the beginning and the end, which is um, the goodness of God. Um, and he um, sends his apostles, Peter and John, two of the greatest people who've ever lived. He sends specifically Peter and John to Samaria the descendants of these people that he was just condemning righteously, he is now choosing to send his love, his apostles, and his spirit. And they had been baptized in the name of Jesus, but then they were baptized or covered, if you like that word better, in um, the Holy Spirit. And I love this. And then look at verse 25. They just kept going around to all the villages of the Samaritans. And you couldn't tell me that they were unfamiliar with Ezekiel chapter 23 because if you had a nation right next to you that hated you and in their holy book it talked about how awful you were, you would know. And look at this God that is choosing to redeem them. And then I think the even the more obvious one is the Good Samaritan, which is mm. Jesus chooses to use you know, let's just say it for what it is. Mm -hmm. the, pe the people of Israel at that time were racist against Samaritans. And that's just what it is. And Jesus yeah. used that on purpose in order to make a significant point. And Jesus uses the people that God had righteously condemned as now the word Samaritan is a byword for being mm -hmm. a good person. Oh, wow. ah. It is. That's awesome. That's what it oh, means. Man, I've never you thought go, about that. You go that's anywhere, so cool. go to any place, and you say, hey, you're a Samaritan. You don't even have to say good. They're like, oh, that's great. You know, yeah. that's great. There's literally hospitals wow. named yeah. after. Exactly. Samaritan. Samaritan. Yeah. Here in Arizona. This, that is powerful. This that is the is. redemption of the good news of God. This is who God is and what God does. It is for the Jew and Gentile. And if you just take the good parts, you don't get the full depth of how good God is. Yeah, you're right. If you're just like, oh, yeah, that Samaritan was a good guy. 
when you take all of it, you get a lot more. Wow. Is there a component to this of Israel for so long being God's chosen people, having favor, being the ones that, you know, God's put up with and you know, just like this whole story arc. And then now you get to this part, you know, acts and, you know, the new Testament, the cross, new covenant, however you want to say it, it's now open to other people. And the, the phrase of, um, this is, it's, it's no direct correlation, but the, but, but this idea of for those that are, um, used to privilege equality must feel like persecution mm -hmm. to them. Um, is, is that like, is that a big factor, you know, cause now Israel is going, we're used to being God's mm -hmm. chosen people. We're used to being the people of privilege. And now God's opening this whole, you know, this, this Holy spirit thing see. up to our level. Look, we're being oppressed. Yeah. It is. It absolutely is. That's the Jerusalem council in acts. And that's this idea of Judaizers in the new mm -hmm. Testament. And then look at the people who are following Paul trying to mm -hmm. kill him. So yeah. when you read when you're getting later in the book of acts, it's exactly that. They're trying to gatekeep the kingdom of God. And God is like, you're the trunk and that's never going to change. Yeah. And you're one of the branches and that's never going to change. Mm. But this was always God's intention. Yeah. Wow. And you see it. Yeah. You know, you see this and the, and you know, the callback going back to, you know, 800 years BC. I love it. One commentary I read on this that I think summarizes this really well said, the severity of conquest and exile had a purpose greater than punishment. The ultimate purpose was to reveal God in both his holy judgments and gracious restorations. Wow. I think that summarizes that really beautifully. That is beautiful. That is beautiful. Well, I hope to everybody watching that you didn't turn it off <laughs> at like 35 minutes because I tried really hard to show the goodness of God yeah. at the end. And uh, thank you guys for watching. Cheers to you. I applaud you for studying the Bible. You're probably really amazing as a person because you're choosing to do this. So God bless you. And if you haven't subscribed, just subscribe and it'll give you more reasons to continue to study with us. Do you guys have anything else at the close? Don't fall asleep if you're a trucker. If you're the trucker, keep trucking. Stay yeah. Mm -hmm. If you're the trucker, we just sincerely thank you for taking an entire truckload of fidget spinners. And if you are the Scientologist, <laughs> Taco Bell, Boomer. we should cut. Loving. Worker. <laughs> Boomer. Boomer. And the late night shift. And you have a daughter Logan's age. And you've got YouTube playing in the background. DM us. We love you.